Thank you, Brandon. Good morning. How are we doing? Awesome. I love it. Yes. Well, I had a day uh, right when my wife and I first got married. Uh, not first when I got married, maybe a year in, where I was not doing awesome. We, uh, I think, if I remember correctly, which she debates this, and my memory is questionable in this story, so fair enough. I thought we were coming back from a wedding that I had performed. Uh, she just thought it was a normal Saturday. And so we got back to our apartment and I started feeling bad. I kind of had a scratchy throat and, and kind of felt congested. And I was just like, I don't feel very good. And she was like, again, we were newly married. She was like, let me get you something to like help you. Now she would be like, fix it yourself. You know, she didn't care. Be like, just don't leave me with the kids, okay? Just, just. So she got me some medicine, came back to the couch. And, and again, newly married. So I was playing Xbox, just sitting there enjoying life. Uh, no kids, right? And she was, again, newly married. So she's like right next to me, which now she'd be like, do whatever you want. I'm going somewhere else away from you. Because I was playing Xbox, not because we don't like each other. We love each other very much. And I started feeling really sleepy, like really sleepy. And I was like, why am I so tired? And she goes, oh my gosh. And I was like, what? She goes, I gave you nighttime cold medicine rather than daytime cold medicine. And I looked at her, and I remember just feeling so betrayed. <laughs> and I looked at her, and I go, you drugged me? <laughs> and that's the last thing I really remember. But I asked a valid question, and it's a question that I ask regularly, and I'm pretty sure many of you ask the same question, whether it is a drug-induced question or not. Why am I so tired? Like, why am I so stinking tired? And I find that question to be super annoying when I've taken a nap and I wake up and I think I've missed the bus to go to school even though I'm almost 40. Like you've had that kind of a nap where it warps you back in time. And you're like, why am I so tired? I had this mega nap and I'm still tired. Why? And it's not just physical tired. Why am I so emotionally tired? Like why is it that there's people that I love that I wanna be around but also when I see that I have like something to do with them on the calendar, I'm like, whew, I don't know that I got it in me. I'm so tired. I'm spiritually tired. Like I want to spend time with the Lord, but at the same time, I'm like, man, I kind of just, I want to give him my best. I want to give him, give him, but I, and I'm just so tired that I fall asleep in the middle of praying. Why am I so tired? I was working on this sermon this week and I went to run through it and I actually think I had discovered uh, a way for, uh, to cure people's fatigue. Because I think if I went with that sermon, y'all were going to just fall asleep in the middle of it. And the reason why was because I was asking the question, how do we rest? How do we rest? How do we rest? How do we rest? And I think that's a valid question, but I don't think it's the one we're ready to ask yet. Because I think we need to know why in the world we're so tired. And if we can answer why we are so tired, Maybe in that we can find how to rest. So today we're going to talk about three reasons why we are so tired. And we're going to look at Hebrews chapter 4. As we keep walking through the book of Hebrews, we've skipped a little bit. We'll cover it, uh, uh, but we've skipped reading it. We're in Hebrews chapter 4. And I think the first reason why we are tired, we are so tired because we do not remember. We do not remember. Look at verse 1 of chapter 4. Now this will be uh, kind of... Kind of convoluted, but we're going to explain it. Verse 1, Therefore, while the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us fear, lest any of you should seem to have failed to reach it. For good news came to us just as to them, but the message they heard did not benefit them, because they were not united by faith with those who listened. For we who have believed enter that rest, as he said, as I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Although his works were finished from the foundation of the world, for he has somewhere spoken of the seventh day in this way, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again, in this passage, he said, they shall not enter my rest. Since therefore it remains for some to enter it, and those who formerly received the good news failed to enter because of disobedience, again he appoints a certain day today, saying through David so long afterward, in the words already quoted, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Again, a lot going on in this passage. 
Chapter four starts talking about rest. And one of the reasons why it's so convoluted, why it's so difficult, is that the author is talking about three different kinds of rest, and he's intermingling them all together. And so it's best to break it down chronologically. First, he is talking about a past rest. This he's drawing largely from chapter three. So he's already explained what's happening in chapter three, and so he's building off that. What he's talking about is, remember, he is writing to a group of Jewish Christians who are considering going back to Judaism because it is a protected religion in Rome. They won't be persecuted anymore if they stop following Jesus and go back to being Jewish. So he's reminding them of the story of the Israelites who wandered in the wilderness, and when they finally got to the promised land, God said, send in some spies, look at the promised land that I'm giving you, and then we're going to take it over together. I'm going to take it over on your behalf. You just have to follow me. And they send the spies in, and they realize that there's gigantic people that live there, like huge. And they're like, we can't do this. And this is the last in a series, a series of rebellions, disobedience, lack of faith, and they finally just, God finally says, look, I, you guys don't trust me. Even though you saw what I did in Egypt, I'm going to start over with your kids and your grandkids, and they're going to be the ones that go into the promised land. You all are going to wander in the wilderness for 40 years, and you're going to die out here. And so this is the group of people that he says, uh, they, they, as I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. This is the past rest he's talking about. But now he relates this to a future rest that is offered to us. This is the eternal kingdom. This is the new heaven and the new earth. This is uh, Jesus restoring all things. And this rest is won for us by his death, his burial, and his resurrection. And so the author is saying, don't be like your ancestors who turned back right on the cusp of entering into his rest by turning back away from a greater rest. Don't reject what God is doing through Jesus Christ. But then there's also a third rest, and it's the rest of today. This is the Sabbath rest. This is the rest that's talked about in Genesis 2.25, when it says that God created everything and he rested. This is the rest that Jesus talks about in the book of Mark, where he says that the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. This is the rest that he's talking about here in chapter 4, where he talks about in verse 4, he says, for he has somewhere spoken of the seventh day in this way, and God rested on the seventh day from all of his works. Now, one of the things that, that, that he's doing by linking all three of these different kind of rests together is he's saying they're all accessed the exact same way. Even though they're different, they're accessed in the same way. <clears throat> and it's through faith. It's through faith. The reason why the Israelites failed to enter into the promised land was because they didn't believe what God said he would do. They saw the giants. They didn't believe God could conquer the giants and they rejected him. They didn't believe. We fail to enter God's eternal rest when we don't believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, when we don't unite ourselves to him by faith. He's done everything. We just need to trust him that that's good enough. And we fail to rest in the Sabbath rest the reason why we fail to rest on a weekly basis is because we don't trust God to take care of things. We don't trust that we can handle our lives on six days rather than seven. We think we need that seventh day to get everything done. That just shows we're, we're, we're over busy, we're over programmed, all that stuff. We're over scheduled because we can't get it all done in six days. So we even bleed over into the seventh. Now, faith is important. Faith is how you enter into the rest. But faith in faith is not how it's done. It can't just be like, oh, I'm just going to trust God to handle everything. It's going to be great. It's not how it works. Faith has to have content. It has to have something. And this is what I mean by the reason why we don't rest. The reason why we are so tired is because we don't remember. We do not remember what God has done. This was the mistake the Israelites made as they entered the promised land. They did not remember the plagues, the crossing of the Red Sea, the way God provided for them in the wilderness. They didn't remember it. And when I say remember, it's not like they, didn't, they just had amnesia. Remembering in the Bible is remembering in such a way that it affects your action. What you know affects the way you live. That's what remembering means. 
the Israelites didn't remember what God has done. And God said, I'm done. I'm out. You guys don't get it. I'm going to start over with the next group. We too have to remember what Christ has done for us. We have to remember his death, his burial, his resurrection, the fact that he came to earth because he loves us, not to punish us, but to pay the penalty for our sin for the way that we failed to remember. That's why he came. And that's the key to resting. That's why we're so tired. It's because we don't remember. We're still trying to do all these things on our own. We are striving constantly to validate ourselves, to improve ourselves. We're constantly trying to, to live life in a way that validates our existence. Do you, uh, some of you probably don't do this, probably most of you, because you're better people than me. But do you ever think or say, maybe when your kids are misbehaving or maybe when you have a coworker that's just absolutely driving you nuts, could you please just give it a rest? Again, you guys probably think it. I say it. Like, just give it a rest. Oh, my gosh. We need to give a rest to our constant self-justification, our constant self-striving. Give it a rest. Give it a rest. And the way you give it a rest, you start by remembering. Now, how do we remember? How do you actually do that, Travis? Well, the first thing I would say is take a Sabbath. Start trying to take some form of a Sabbath, whether it's if you can't do a whole day, do a half day. If you can't do a half a day, quarter day, start there. I don't know. Take an evening. Take a Sabbath. Now, we'll talk about what that looks like moving forward. So we're going to build this out a little bit more. But the Israelites were told in Deuteronomy 6 to write the words of God on their home and to, uh, to, to have basically to write notes on, in boxes and put them on their bodies. And, and so they would remember the words of God. And their kids, are, it says in Deuteronomy 6, that God says, your kids are going to ask you why you do this. Almost anticipating that kids are like, why do we do this? And you're supposed to tell them, because we were slaves in Egypt. And we do this to remember what God has done so that we can rest in the promised land that he has given us. We need to do things to remind us. And so taking a Sabbath, taking a day where you just take, a mo take time just to be like, God has done everything that I need to do to be loved by him. Take a Sabbath. Another thing that the Old Testament teaches us is the concept of the Ebenezer. Now, some of you are sitting here being like, Ebenezer Scrooge? Like, you want us to go by Christmas villages? Yes. I love a good Christmas village. No. An Ebenezer comes from 1 Samuel 7. The Israelites had uh, turned themselves over to idolatry. They repented, and God won a great victory over the Philistines. And so Samuel takes basically a rock, puts it down somewhere, and calls the place Ebenezer, which basically means up to this point, God has helped us. We need to have things in our lives where you can remember what God has done. Physical things that you can look at and be like, oh yeah, I remember when God did this. I remember when God did that. Ebenezer's. And so what God wants to do is to remind us. So maybe you have some, some trinkets or something that you've bought through the, uh, through the way. Like, like um, maybe when you went through like a difficult time. I've realized that my kids have stuffed animals and they almost act as like Ebenezer's to them. My kids will be like, oh yeah, I got this when I was sick. And oh yeah, I got this when I went and did this. I'm not suggesting you go buy stuffed animals, but it's kind of the concept I'm going for. Not like little idols, and I don't mean that, or little, little shrines. That's not what I'm talking about. Another idea is to, to have pictures that you can write notes about. And like, oh, this is what was happening at this time. Journaling is a form of an Ebenezer. When you go back and read through it, music can be an amazing Ebenezer because we all have music that we listen to and we identify, we remind of a certain period in our lives. And you're like, oh yeah, I remember when God was doing this or I remember how bad I felt and then God did something amazing. That's how we remember. And remembering allows us to be catapulted into the next idea and the next reason why we're tired. We're tired because we don't rejoice. We are tired because we do not rejoice. Look at verse uh, verse 8, 
For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken of another day later on. So then there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works as God did from his. So the Hebrews are thinking about going back to Judaism. So the, the author of Hebrews goes and talks about Sabbath because that was such an Sabbath. This idea of taking time to point them to a greater rest later. Now, there's really two ideas being talked about within these verses about Sabbath rest. The first is the idea of rejoicing or joy, okay? In the Old Testament, the Sabbath had a lot to do with joy. One, there is, so there's three different kinds of Sabbath that they take. There's a Sabbath day, there's a Sabbath year, and then there's like a, a, a super Sabbath, which sounds like a Walmart deal, but it's not. So the Sabbath day, we already kind of know about that, right? You, you rest on that day. The Sabbath year was every seven years, the Israelites were told not to work. You work for six years, you harvest, and then the seventh year, you let everything lay fallow. You let it not produce. Don't let the ground work. They would take a seventh year off. Can you imagine not harvesting for like a whole year? I mean, we practice crop rotation, but that's like chill. Like, just don't do anything. I mean, I think many of us would absolutely lose our minds not working for an entire year. Either that or you're European. Because <laughs> they take like those really long vacations in the summer, right? That's amazing. We've got to get in on that. It's a great idea. But some of us, like, we can't take a weekend off, much less like a day or, or, or a whole summer, a whole year. But can you imagine the joy? God promised them. That like for the sixth year, there'd be this bountiful harvest, just more than they could possibly handle. And it was actually going to last them all the way up to year nine. Can you imagine bringing in that harvest? You know that feeling you have when you're about to go on vacation? Can we all agree that the best day of vacation is the night before you actually go on vacation? It's the best. You're so optimistic. You're like, I'm going to get so much done and I'm going to rest. It's going to be great. Can you imagine the joy that comes from that, taking in that harvest? But there's also this super Sabbath idea. This is the idea of Jubilee, the year of Jubilee. And every 50 years, they would take, uh, there was this rule that they had to have a Sabbath like mega year and anybody that was a slave got to go free. Anybody that had sold their property to another Israelite because they fell on financial hard times, they got their land back. Can you imagine how joyful that would be? You know, like, hey, we're getting it back. It's going to come back to the family. I may not be there for it, but it's going to come back. Imagine the joy. That's why they call it the year of Jubilee. The Sabbath is there. Rest is there to help us rejoice, to celebrate what God has done. And many of us are so tired because we don't take time to celebrate God. We don't take time to rejoice in him. We don't take time to, to remember what he's done and celebrate him. Not to worship rest, but to worship God for giving us the rest. And that leads us to the second idea, the idea of enjoying. So there's rejoicing, but there's also enjoying. Look at verse 10. It says, for whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works as God did from his. He's talking about that seventh day of creation where God's rest, resting. Do you know why God rested? It's not because he was tired, okay? It's not like God was like, I am beat, Making a duck took a long time. And have you ever made something that can be on the water and in the land and in the air and waddles and somehow doesn't die? It's exhausting. No, that's not how he acts. That's not what God does. I think God rests for two reasons. One, to show us exactly who he is and exactly what we are supposed to do to remember that we need to rest. But I also think he rests to enjoy what he made. He made a duck for crying out loud. I want to sit back and watch that thing. He looks, look at all that I made. Look at, look at those interactions. Look at those animals. Look at the way this is working. All the trees are doing exactly what they're supposed to do. He's enjoying it. He's celebrating it. So many of us work so dad blasted hard and you enjoy nothing that God has given you, nothing. How many of you have a hobby that you find to be so life-giving and you never get to do it because you're so busy? 
Some of y'all in here are elbowing your spouse. I want to go golf. <laughs> I wish I could do. How many of us have kids that we break our backs to provide the very best that we can for them, but you work so hard you can't actually enjoy being around your children because you're so tired? How many of us cannot enjoy what God has given us because we are just so tired and we continue to work and work and work and work? And work. God has given us an example to follow of enjoying Him and His blessings. That's what the Sabbath is there for. It is there for us to enjoy Him and enjoy His blessings. And this is where remembering is really critical. Because if you just go straight to enjoying what He's giving you, that's idolatry. That's leisure. I mean, leisure is not bad, but it's idolatry. That idea of just, oh, I love the stuff that I have. But when you remember what God has done, what Christ has done for you, and then you look at what he's doing now, you're like, oh my gosh, I'm so thankful. Now, I know not everything's perfect. You may not be satisfied. It's not hard to look at the world and be like, oh my gosh, there are tragic things happening. It can be hard to be satisfied. It can be hard to be thrilled with what God is doing. But there is a day supposed to be set aside every single week where we remember what God has done, and then we look at what he's doing in our life so far, and we think, hey, I see the progress. I see what he's doing. And even though it's not perfect yet, it will be one day. God is working. And so our Sabbath is supposed to look forward to that eternal Sabbath rest. What do you think the new heaven and the new earth is going to be like? It's going to be Sabbath. Now, some of you are like, oh, that sounds awful. Just not doing anything? Like, just can't? No. There is a difference between work and toil. There's a difference between work and toil. How many of you have an activity that you find incredibly life-giving, but it also wears you out? How many of you like to, to exercise or run? You don't have to raise your hands. It's a very slow group, apparently. It's okay. It's just fine. Maybe you got flat feet. It's great. Running is exhausting, but it's incredibly life-giving if you enjoy doing it. For some of you, I'm not running unless somebody chases me. And even then, I might be like, nah, not worth it. <laughs> How many of you work really hard to like perfect a craft or, or to cook, and you love cooking, but you're exhausted? That's not toil for you. That's a, a fruitful kind of work that's really good. That's not toil. My wife loves organizing things. I think that is not a fun hobby. I'll come in on a Sunday afternoon, I'm like, what are you doing? And she's like, I'm organizing my sock drawer. And I'm like, oh, look at my drawer. It's, I wear the same three pairs. <laughs> and I just wash them. I don't have to have it organized. It's just a pile of socks. Some of you organized people are like, oh my gosh, that's awful. <laughs> There's a difference between work and toil. It is okay to do something on the Sabbath. Just do something that's life-giving. Don't do things that just... Drain your soul. That is not resting. The last reason why we are so tired. We're tired because we don't remember. We're tired because we don't rejoice. And we are tired because we do not reflect. We do not reflect. Look at verse 11. Let us therefore strive to enter that rest so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. Remember the reason why the Israelites didn't enter into the rest. is They didn't believe what God said he would do. The reason why we do not enter into God's eternal rest or his Sabbath rest is we do not believe that God has provided for us for our eternal security, or we do not believe that God is going to take care of our lives today. Unbelief, remember, is not believing God's word. It's not believing what he says he will do. So the question becomes, how do I know if I'm obeying? How do I know if I'm really doing it or if I'm doing this based on rote uh, sort of habit? If you've been a Christian long enough, you start to question, am I doing this just because it's a pattern for me or am I doing this because I'm, I'm, I'm genuinely following Jesus? 
You go through a dry period in your life spiritually and you're like, maybe I'm not really a believer. Maybe I'm not really focused on him. So how do we know? How do we know? It's because we do not reflect. We need to reflect. You need to take time to examine yourself before the Lord and to let him examine you. This is what it's talking about. The word of God cutting through, uh, what does it say, bones and marrow and spirit and soul. This isn't a, a treaty on what makes up a human being. This is talking about our tendency to defend ourselves. We have this tendency to put forward a, a persona, somebody that we think people will accept. And we do that to God too, even though we know he knows us, he knows what and who we are. We still put forward the, the little righteous person that we think God wants us to be. And we still put forward the church going person that we think God wants us to be. And when we read God's word and you spend time in it and you reflect on it, it cuts through all that stuff. It exposes you. You find yourself to be naked and bare before him. And it says, notice, you have to answer to him. Who in the Old Testament found themselves naked before God and having to answer a question? Adam and Eve. God asked them, did you eat from the fruit that I told you not to eat from? Did God ask them that because he didn't know? He was like, I've just got to figure this out. I guess I'll start asking questions. No, he knew. He wants them to think about what they've done and answer him. He allows his word to cut through all their defenses and to answer the question themselves so that they know what they've done. They use fig leaves. We use church attendance and generosity. It's the same thing. We try to put forward our best foot, and we're really just trying to show God that we're maybe not as bad as we really are. We have to let the word of God read us as we read it. You have to let it expose you. And you might say, Travis, that sounds awful. And it is. It is unless two things happen. You remember who is doing the exposing and why he's doing it. So let's talk about who is doing it. Remember it says the word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword. And so we think about it. It's like, oh, it's talking about the Bible. And it is. But remember that in John chapter one, the word is Jesus Christ. He is the one, the son of God is the one who gives power and authority. He's the one who makes the Bible living and active through the power of his spirit. And so he's like the swordsman behind the sword. If I look in my backyard and we have like two plastic swords back there and I see my children wailing away on each other with plastic swords, which they do. If those were real swords, I would be horrified. They don't know what they're doing. They're going to hurt each other. They're going to hurt themselves. Even if they're trying to like chase off an animal or something, they're more dangerous to themselves with the swords because they know what they're doing. But if you watch a, a swordsman or a fencer, it's amazing what they can do with a sword. It's amazing what they can do with that. They can disable, they can disarm, they can maim, they can even kill. It's like that sword is an extension of who they are. And this is what Jesus is. Jesus is the swordsman. And all he wants to do is disarm you. He wants to take away the idols, the self-justification, the self-perception, the selfishness, the misguidedness that fatigues us, all that work we put into that. He wants to disarm us of that because we're more dangerous to ourselves and other people. And then when he's disarmed us of it and we're looking there, we're like, oh, I can totally see how I didn't know what I was doing. I need to learn to follow you. This is what he does. The word of God is there to disarm us of these things that we hold that are actually more dangerous. And the reason why he does this is to give us rest. To give us rest. Remember it talks about Joshua not giving the Israelites their rest. Verse eight of chapter four says, for if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken of another day later on. So Joshua doesn't give them the rest. What he's talking about is Joshua leads the Israelites to conquer the promised land, the new generation, but he doesn't finish the job. And so when he's dying, he's telling them, you all need to finish the work of conquering the land so that you can have the rest that God has promised you. And he tells them, be strong and courageous and go forward in faith. But Joshua didn't finish the job. What's interesting is Jesus now comes along. Jesus is the one who does give us rest. It is a better rest 
Do you know what the Greek word for Joshua is? It's Jesus. Jesus is a newer and better Joshua. He's the one that wins the victory. He's conquered the rest for us. It's there to be handed to us. We don't have to do a thing. We don't have to lift a finger. We don't have to be strong and courageous. You know why? Because Jesus tells us something different. He doesn't say be strong and courageous. You know what he tells us? Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you what? Rest. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. The new Joshua gives us a better rest, and he's already conquered it for us through his death, his burial, and his resurrection. We do not rest. We are so tired because we do not remember that he's done that for us. We do not rejoice in the fact that he's done that for us. And we don't reflect on it, allowing us to consider what it means for me and what he's doing in my life. Some of us have never united ourselves to Christ in faith. Some of us have never put our faith in him to give us that eternal rest. You can do that today. Put your faith in him. Let him give you that rest. Some of us who have been Christians for a long time aren't resting. You're still just as tired as somebody that doesn't believe in Jesus at all. It's because you don't remember what he's done for you. It's because you aren't rejoicing in him and enjoying what he's given you. It's because you're trying so very hard to continue to move forward without reflecting on the things that he wants to disarm you of. You can do that today. We're going to take some time to have some time of reflection and rest. As the band comes out to sing and lead us in worship, I'm going to pray and we're going to enter into just a time of rest and reflection. You don't have to sing with us. You can just take a moment to start the, the Sabbathing process, okay? So let's pray. Father God, thank you uh, for the Sabbath. Thank you that you offer us a, a better rest in you, Lord God. And Lord, we desperately need to rest. We are a tired culture. We are a tired people. We're a culture that glorifies working until you are exhausted and then working more. Lord, may we reject that narrative. May you disarm us of that. And may you give us the strength to rest today. Lord, hear the prayers of your people. Speak to us now. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen.